Hello, everybody. Good afternoon for those of you in Europe, and good morning to those of us in the US, and good evening to folks in the uh, Far East, I suppose. So I just want to make sure um, everybody can hear me. So if I can just get a, a hello or something in the chat real quick, just to confirm that um, everything as it should be, that would be fantastic. Hey, all right, fantastic. Lots of hellos. Great to see. You. Thank you very much. All right. Well, good. Um, so welcome. So for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking about Composer. And this isn't going to be a basics uh, session, but it's not going to be a super advanced session. Um, this is really aimed right towards the middle. So those of you who filled out the pool, poll, uh, thank you very much. Um, so the second one, how comfortable are you using Composer? This is really geared towards the not comfortable at all and the comfortable with the basics. So I'm pretty sure I'm gonna teach those folks something new. Um, to the 34% of you who marked super comfortable, now that's a bit of a challenge for me. Um, I guess it depends on, now it's 37%, so it's not getting better. Um, I guess it, it depends on how we each define super comfortable, but hopefully there'll be you know a few nuggets in here that will um, that everybody can can uh, take away. Um, really interesting to see that only twenty percent of you are using Composer two. Um, so maybe the big takeaway for a lot of you folks at the end of this is that you can, for most of you, um, unless you're doing some wacky stuff with Composer, um, Composer two really shouldn't be a big deal. Uh, and you get a lot of performance and a lot of speed. And then for the Drupal roll question, um, you know, the mix here, usually it's mostly site builders and coders as, um, as we see these results. So that looks pretty good. So um, I say uh, off we go. So I don't know if, um, if when you join uh, this panel or this session, you can scroll up in the discussion chat, but I actually have this URL um, right at the very top of the chat. So um, if you want access to these slides, there it is right there. And if someone else, um, if you can't see it all the way at the top, if you can't scroll up for some reason, if someone else can just paste it in, that would be fantastic. So I can just uh, keep on talking, which is uh, what I'm apt to do. And feel free, if you have a question, feel free to ask it in the, um, use the live Q and A. And I've got a whole dashboard here um, provided by the on-air platform where I can see all the questions. And I have it right in my eye line. So um, as questions come in, I should be able to see them uh, pretty readily. And um, I will answer them you know, as I get them or, um, uh, you know, or at the end, but usually um, you know, as they come in. All right, so what are we gonna cover today? So we're going to go with, uh, we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive onto version constraints. Um, specific, when, you want, when you want a specific version of a dependency and you know, we're at a Drupal event here. So I think for the most part, this comes into play when we want like a, you know, an alpha version of a module or the dev version of a module or, um, or something like that. So we'll talk about that, go a little bit deeper. We'll talk about plugins. Um, and not, again, not super deep, but we'll do um, a couple of examples. Um, and dependency conflict resolution. So this is a, a big one because this is, I know for me, when I first started using Composer, this was the big scary, right? So you're trying to do something and Composer says no. Um, well, what, how, do you, how do you get around that? How do you work through that? I guess is the, you know, it's, it's the biggest question. So we'll talk about some strategies for that. Um, but da, da, da. and Joe, so I see your comment question. Okay, very good. I, get, I think everybody else can see that. Um, I will. Well, when we get to slide twenty six, we can we can we can talk about that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the composer .lock file and how the composer .lock file, um, especially when you have divergent branches, can be the source of a code conflict with Git. So we can talk about that a little bit. Um, and then Composer 2 versus Composer 1. Um, and we'll talk about that. So that's kind of the plan for the next, uh, now we're down to 40 minutes. So here we go. So let's start with version constraints. We'll kind of ease into this a little bit. 
Um, let's talk about this, the carrot versus the tilde. Because again, this is something um, I find, and I teach a lot of folks how to, how to use Drupal and how to use Composer. And this is a little bit of a gray area, I think. So really simply, the, the simplest way to look at this is when you use the carrot when specifying a version constraint, something like, you know, carrot 1.0, what this does is it locks the first digit. So when you, in the future, when you do a composer update and your version constraint is carrot 1.0, that will allow you to go to basically get any release version of uh, version one. So 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 1.5, 1 but the carrot locks in that first digit. So you won't be able to get version two unless you change the version constraint. The tilde is a little bit different where it allows the last digit specified to float. So if you have caret 1.0 and tilde 1.0, those are in fact the exact same constraint because the caret locks the first digit and the tilde allows this, the last digit specified to float. Where the tilde comes in handy is when you want to um, basically lock down a particular dependency to a minor release. If you have tilde 1.1.0, then a composer update will only allow you to go to 1.1.3, 1.1.4. It won't let you go to 1.2. anything unless again, you change that version constraint. So caret locks the first digit, tilde allows that last digit specified to float. And Jaws, I see your, um, your comment. Um, we're gonna talk about that. That's a slide coming up. Yeah, and we're gonna demo that in a minute or so. Um, so examples. So uh, uh, carrot uh, 2.0 basically gets you anything in the 2.0 to 3.0 range um, without allowing 3.0. Um, 2.0.0 uh, with the carrot is exactly the same. Um, it doesn't matter how many digits you specified when you're using the caret, it still only locks that first digit. Um, tilde 2.0, again, is the same as caret 2.0, but tilde 2.0.0 allows that last digit to float. So that gets you all the way up, but uh, not including 2.1. So for those of you who had a little uh, gray area or, or a little trouble uh, with the difference between caret versus tilde, uh, there you go. And then we, uh, pre-release versions. So let's say you don't want a release version. Um, if you do a caret 1.0 at beta, that basically will get you anything between one and, major version one and two, including all beta and release candidate versions. So think of the at beta as a minimum. Um, if you want a specific beta, you can do that as well. And this is you know, super handy in the Drupal community because we like our alphas and betas um, and release candidates. So even if there is a beta three out for a particular um, module, if you ask for beta dot two, you're gonna get beta two. Um, when you add the dash dev at the end, this is a little bit different. Um, now you're gonna, this is getting the dev release, but it's not a download. This is a clone. So we're not gonna get too deep into this discussion, but if you are committing dependencies to your repo, you have to you know, understand that when you're cloning something, you're now getting a repo inside of your repo and you have to handle that. Um, if you're not committing dependencies, then it's not a big deal. And you can even get more granular than this. You can clone a specific commit. So say you don't want the entire dev version, say you want the dev version minus one commit, well, you can then um, basically ask for dev dash, the name of the branch, pound, the first few characters of your of the commit hash that you're looking for. So Composer is really flexible. And um, if you just know a few of these little rules, you can normally get exactly what you're looking for. And uh, this goes to uh, Jaws. So let's actually look at the Semver um, for a moment. This is a really super handy um, uh, way to visualize what these version constraints do. So let's look at Drupal core recommended. And let's say that we are looking for, you know, version 
well, here, let's start with the tilde, tilde 8.0. Um, well, I'm going to search for that one there, tilde 8.0. So remember, the tilde locks in the first digit, and I know the, um, the, the color contrast here is terrible. Um, so just bear with me, please. But I have tilde 8.0 in this box right here. And we're only looking at stable. So meaning um, we don't have an at beta, you know, we can change this to beta and this would, this is equivalent to putting the at beta at the end of it, but we're only looking at stable releases. And obviously in all of these boxes, these are all the various releases for Drupal uh, core recommended. Um, but we are filtering it by tilde, I'm sorry, caret 8.0, which means we're locking in the eight. So sure enough, we're getting everything from 8.0.0 up to the latest release of um, the 8.x uh, major version, which is 8.9.11. Because we're only looking at stable releases, none of the devs or the betas or the release candidates or the alphas are in there. Now, if we change this to tilde, you'll see the results are exactly the same. But if we do it, if we add tilde, 8.0.0, now you see that we're limited just to the 8.0.x series. So this is a really super handy way of kind of visualizing not only tilde versus caret, but also, well, what happens if we throw in the beta versions, right? So now we're going to get all betas and release candidates of the 8.0 branch there, I'm sorry, 8.0 series, I should say. Um, and if we go all the way down to dev, basically anything that starts with 8.0 is gonna be eligible. So really handy tool, um, you know, definitely use it. Um, you know, I, I, find, I find it extremely helpful. Okay, so um, here's something that I kind of learned the hard way and um, are these two statements always equivalent? If you do uh, a series of requirements, require vendor name one and require vendor name two, are you always gonna get the same results if you do that versus if you combine them, if you ask to get both dependencies at the same time? And the answer is while often you will get the same results, there are some situations where you won't. Um, and so consider the case where um, you're getting a, you know, a taco dependency that requires, you know, cheese version 3.0 or better. And you're also asking for a, a burrito dependency that requires cheese version 2.0 or better. So if you do a composer require vendor taco, you're likely to get, well, not likely, you will get cheese version 3.0. And then in your second step, if you then try to do vendor, you know, composer require vendor burrito, you're going to get a conflict. You're going to get, well, it's not going to be a conflict, but composer is going to say, I can't do that because um, this requires something in the 2.x branch of cheese and you have something in the 3.x uh, branch of cheese, uh, uh, version of cheese. So you're going to have an issue if you try and do taco then burrito. Oops, sorry. But if you try to combine them, if you do a composer require vendor taco space vendor burrito, then composer will look at all of the sub dependencies for taco and all of the sub dependencies for burrito and basically find a, um, a version that is, um, that works. And in this case, um, you know, actually now that I look at the slide, this is kind of a lie. Um, we would actually have to loosen up the, 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 um, this is actually, now that I look at this, this is kind of a lie because these still won't resolve because this one wants to get a 3.0. Uh, but hopefully you can take my point where um, if you have multiple dependencies where there could be a, a sub-dependency conflict, often it's better to try to require them at the same time and let Composer figure it, figure it out. Okay, moving on. Let's talk about plugins for a moment. Let me just grab a sip. I'm gonna make a note that I need to fix that, um, that one slide. I have another example, but not super handy. All right, so Composer plugins, um, you know, when I introduce Composer plugins to folks who are brand new to Composer, but understand Drupal, 
Um, I always use the analogy that composer plugins are to composer what Drupal modules are to Drupal, right? Drupal modules extend the functionality of Drupal. Composer plugins extend the functionality of composer. So hopefully most of you already realized that, but sometimes it's good to say these things out loud. So we do have some included with the Drupal recommended project composer template. Um, obviously composer installers. Now this is a plugin that um, allows us to, or doesn't allow us, but it instructs um, our project to, um, when we require a Drupal module, composer installers has the logic that says, oh, that's a Drupal module. I wanna put that in the modules contrib directory as opposed to the vendor directory. So composer install installers basically allows us to install dependencies in places other than the default vendor directory. Super handy, this is not a Drupal specific plugin. There's lots of uh, open source projects that use composer installers. It's been around forever, it's rock solid. Um, Drupal core composer scaffold. Um, before Drupal 8.8 .8 came out, when this Drupal recommended project composer template was released, Drupal core compose, uh, th there was a plugin to handle the scaffolding files. And, and Drupal scaffolding files are like the HT access file and index.php and the install. Um, um, well, not really the installer anymore, but um, all the files that kind of exist outside of the core directory. And before Drupal 8.8, .8, um, the plugin that handled these scaffolding files basically phoned home to drupal.org every time that a composer command was run and re-downloaded those files from drupal.org. So you can imagine that's a ton of requests on drupal.org to, you know, to download scaffolding files. And that didn't really make any sense. Um, the new scaffolding plugin that was released at the same time with Drupal 8.8, .8, it's called Drupal slash core composer scaffold. Um, much more robust, um, much more performant, and a lot more flexible. And we'll do a demo um, of its flexibility here in a minute or two. But the bottom line is that scaffolding files are now included in an assets directory, which is part of Drupal core. And you can actually look in your core directory and see assets and in there there's scaffolding files. And when the scaffolding plugin runs, it basically just copies files from the core directory into the right place. And as part of that process, um, we can configure Composer to get involved in the process. So think of it kind of like a hook, right? We use Drupal hooks all the time to get involved with user login or entity display and, or, or things like that. Well, Core Composer Scaffold allows us to get involved in the process of scaffolding files. Um, one that's not included with recommended project, but most folks um, who start using Composer uh, ultimately end up using is Composer Patches, which is a super easy way to apply patches to your site. And we'll do a demo of this in a moment. Um, and there's a bunch of other ones. I actually wrote a blog post about it a, a few months ago. So you can go to this URL um, uh, to see um, uh, a few more. All right, so let's do a, a quick core composer scaffold example. Um, again, allows you to customize Drupal scaffolding files. So let's do the example of removing your project's readme.txt. So over here, I have a project. Um, oh, let me see, CD web, ls a oh, there we go. So do I have, uh, yeah, okay. So I've got a project up and running. This is a brand new Drupal 9 project. I just created it yesterday. And here's the scaffolding file, readme.txt. Now this file is not necessary for the site to operate. You know, just like install.txt. Um, you know, these two files, and there's some more in other places, but these two files are not, they're, they're nice to have, they're informational, but we don't really need them. So, um, and they can actually provide information to potential attackers to help fingerprint what CMS your site is running. So, why not at all possible? I try not to include these on production. So what we can do with the scaffolding plugin is we can actually tell a scaffolding plugin to not include these scaffolding files. Um, and it's, it, it, it's really easy. So I'm gonna go back out um, and I'm gonna, up, I'm gonna modify my composer.json file. And over here, I've got a little code snippet. Um, so step one is 
uh, well, I'll do this in a second. I should have done this a second ago. We're going to manually delete the existing one. And then we're going to add just a little bit of code. And I've got to come out of presentation mode here just so I can copy and paste. We're going to add a little bit of code to our composer at JSON. So this extra section of your composer at JSON, this is basically like preferences for all of your composer plugins. That's one way of thinking about it. So here is the Drupal scaffold area. This is for the core composer scaffolding plugin. So underneath that, I'm gonna add a new bit of information that says file mapping. And we're basically gonna tell it, let me just get all of my things lined up here. So we're gonna basically say, this is a to and a from. So we're gonna copy to the web root, which is our web directory, to this file false, meaning we're gonna copy nothing to this. And just by adding this, we're basically telling uh, the core composer scaffolding plugin that we don't want the readme file copied out of the core directory anymore. We want this, you know, you know we just don't want this anymore. So I'm gonna save that. I'm gonna RM the readme. RM, where am I? Readme.txt, where am I? Oh, I'm sorry. That's why it wasn't working. Web, read, oh, man, can't type today. There we go. All right, so LS web, okay. So the readme file's gone. So now if we just do a composer install, so it basically, uh, checks to see um, if anything needs to be installed. It reruns the scaffolding plugin at this point. And if we look again, we still don't have the readme file there, which means that it's not coming back. So we can do the same thing for install.txt um, and virtually any other file. And that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg when it comes to uh, what the scaffolding core composer scaffold plugin does. We can also patch files, which is very handy, and especially with like the HT access file. We can append. Um, a lot of folks like to append things to their robots.txt. Um, you can actually um, uh, have another um, composer uh, dependency also get involved in the process of adding new um, uh, uh, adding new scaffolding files as well. So I know a lot of hosting companies um, they add like YAML files. So you can actually automate that process using this plugin as well. So super handy, well-documented. It's part of Drupal core uh, as of Drupal 8.8. Okay, so I see a question. Uh... So let me save that one towards the end because that one's not specific to what I'm covering right now, uh, Michael, if that's okay. Okay, so let me go back into presentation mode here for a moment. Where are we on time? Okay, I've got about 20 minutes left. All right, composer patches. This is one, again, if you, you know, in the poll at the very top, if you're comfortable with the basics and you're not using composer basics, um, then uh, this is definitely uh, something that I think you'd be interested in. So I see a question, Nick, can you copy files in the extra section for Drupal scaffolding? I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Can you make it like a duplicate or can you copy files one for, from one location to like the web directory? If it's the second one, then yes. Okay, so Composer Patches, really dead simple way to apply patches to um, modules or Drupal core. I, I use it for Drupal core and modules all the time. Um, it's again, it's just a plugin, so you require it like anything else. Um, it is compatible with uh, Composer 2.0. Um, uh, Selwyn, hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. Um, I'm going to answer that in a moment, uh, but a short version most people, yes, can be using Composer 2. All right, so let's do this demo real quick. So, as part of this little demo project, I have I have the module draggable views uh, installed. So I did a composer require of this, you know, before the session, just so we have 
we don't have to wait for that. But let's say there's a patch for it that I want to apply. Um, now I could go in and I could go in and, you know, manually apply it, you know, either like really manually apply it or use like a patch command to apply it. But um, it's actually pretty darn easy just to let Composer patches uh, do it for us. So again, I'm just going to do, uh, I'm going to update my composer.json and I'm going to come to the bottom here again in the extra section. Now the extra section is where we put configuration for our plugins. So I'm going to come to the very bottom um, and I believe it's going to be right here. So I have to put a comma there. Uh, duh, 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 and I'm just going to copy this code. Oh, where are the patches? Come on. Maybe I missed one, but let's see. Oh no, that's going to be, I just have to, I'm in the wrong place. Because that's the end of the extra section. So it's going to go here. All right, so you add a new patches section. So again, the composer patches module is going to be looking for this key inside of your extras. And then for each, two, three, four, for each dependency you, you want to patch, you basically add um, its vendor name. So, oh, that's actually the wrong code. Ah. Control, control, control. Okay, so look at that. I updated up here, but I didn't update down there. So glad I caught that. Easy enough fix, copy. And I will sh talk about the, uh, there we go. All right, so we're gonna patch Drupal draggable views and this is vendor name. So this is the same name that we used when we required it. And it's gonna be an array of patches. In this case, we only have one patch. So the first part of it is basically just a description. So this can be anything you want. I tend to keep this the same description or the same text as what the issue description is. And then the second half of this is basically just the path to the patch. And this doesn't have to be local. As you can see, this is the patch directly on drupal.org. Um, so if you can identify which patch you wanna use, and I think I have everything up. If you can identify which path you wanna use and you can use composer patches. And this is basically saying, hey, Composer Patches uh, plugin, I'd like you to patch this dependency with this patch. So let's give that a shot. I like Composer Validate. This tells me if I have um, any uh, syntax errors, like missing uh, commas or anything like that, which I don't. But let's do a Composer install and see if that patches. So we can see um, it gathered pat patches for the dependencies. Um, and so what happens is it reinstalls the dependency. And this is, I believe, just to make sure it has an absolute clean copy. And then it attempts to apply the patch. Um, and in this case, it applied the patch. And you can see here's our little description. If the patch doesn't apply, you'd get a little message saying patch did not apply, but it's patched. And even if we update draggable views, say, that come, say there's a 2.0.1 release, um, it will still try to apply this patch. Um, if the patch doesn't apply, well, then we have to go back and do our homework in the issue and maybe reroll the patch or something. But um, until this patch gets committed, you know, just leave the, the information in your composer.json. And once that patch becomes part of a release, you can remove it from your composer.json, you're good to go. But this makes it really just dead simple to patch core and other dependencies. Okay, um, looking at the questions here. Um, Nick had, am I going to copy and pattern that from outside? Yep, you can absolutely do that, Nick. Absolutely do that, 100%. All right, how are we on time? We've got 15 minutes left. All right, I think we're going to be fine. Okay, let's talk about dependency conflict resolution a bit. Um, this happens a lot um, when you think that you should be able to update something. You can see that there's an update and you go to do a composer update vendor name and you get this message or something similar. I think this was the, in composer one, this was the text. 
it's a little bit different, but the same, the gist is the same in, in, in Composer 2. Um, so how do you troubleshoot that? I always start with why not. Um, why not is actually an alias for the prohibits command, um, but I think why not makes a lot more sense. Um, you know, you're trying to do a composer update, you know, vendor slash taco, and you get this message and I say, well, composer, why not vendor slash taco? Why can't I update it? So it just kind of makes sense. And what, what why not will show you is it will basically give you a little summary of what's blocking it. So here's like a really silly example, but I like this one. Oops. Let's come over here. Um, so if I try and do a composer update twig twig. Now this is kind of a real obvious one because twig is part of Drupal core. So obviously twig is going to be locked to a specific version. Um, but actually here, let's use another command first. Out, outdated twig. Outdated will let us know if there are any uh, if there are any updates, so we're currently using Twig 2.14.1 in Drupal 9, um, but there's you know version three of Twig is out there. So if you're kind of new to Drupal or, or you're not really sure like how it all works yet, you might think, oh well, I definitely want the new Twig, and you're going to try and do a composer update Twig Twig, and you're going to get this little message. Um, nothing to install, update, or remove. And you're like, well, what are you talking about? You know, I can see very clearly that there's an update to Twig and I'm telling you to update it. So why can't I have it? So composer, why not? And if you do a why not, it'll tell you exactly that. Well, this dependency requires this constraint. So somewhere above 1.41 or above 2.12. Drupal core basically wants something in the 2.12 range, but core recommended requires exactly this. So we cannot update twig because these, these three things that depend on twig are specifying these versions. So again, this is a really simple, easy example, but you can extrapolate this for any dependency. Um, and I know that this is, you know, I've had trouble with, I think the, the, um, the GSPR module, is that the right acronym, GDPR? Um, at some point that was dependent on an older version of Drush, which seemed nutty, it, it, it's no longer, but um, I actually was doing office hours with some of my students one day and we stumbled upon that one and um, it ended up being a really great lesson in how to use why not to figure out what was blocking an update. Okay, so I see Usman, I see your question and I see some stuff in the chat. I'm gonna save both of those to the end, if that's okay. Um, you can always use composer depends vendor name. It gives you similar information, um, you know, as far as, well, here, let's just show it to composer depends, twig, twig. But to be quite honest, I end up using, you know, why not all the time. Um, they're not exactly, I think in some cases they might give you dif different information, but I, you know, it's good to know that that one exists. Oops. Uh, Composer outdated, I just showed you. Um, this one is, is, is pretty handy. You can just do a Composer outdated on everything. And this will show you direct and indirect dependencies. Um, a direct dependency is one that you specified that you actually said composer require. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of these, um, but if you, you can do a composer outdated direct, if you just wanna see direct dependencies and there are none that are outdated since I just created this site yesterday. You can also do a composer outdated, I believe it's minor only. Um, for minor updates, this will throw out any major updates. Let's let that finish. Yeah, so I tend to use Compo Composer Outdated instead of using the available updates page on drupal.org because available updates doesn't show you that, you that there's an update to Drush or there's an update to Composer plugins. Um, this basically shows you everything in your project. So what, I mean, I shouldn't say I never use available updates, but um, this is kind of my first stop. 
um, with Composer outdated when it comes time to think about doing updates for my site. There's a direct, and I showed you earlier, you can do twig slash star, you can you know, use wildcards there. Okay, so when you do get a conflict resolution, my first stop is try and diagnose, try and figure out what the problem is, because if you can identify the problem, you can usually solve it. Um, a lot of times I end up removing problem dependencies and then just re-requiring them. And I would say 50% of the time for me, this solves the problem. So if I know that I have an issue with two modules or a module in Drush, as in that GDPR example, um, I'll just remove them both and then require them together at the same time and see if Composer can figure out the, the dependency issues at that point. Um, another thing, which I'm sure a lot of folks uh, ha have tried, delete the vendor directories. And I say vendor directories here is I'm not talking just about the vendor directory, but any directory where dependencies end up. So it'd be vendor, module slash contrib, theme slash contrib, maybe even core. Um, and then do a composer install just to reinstall all that stuff. Um, I know some folks advocate deleting, you know, vendor directories and deleting the composer.lock and then doing a composer install. I try to avoid this at all costs. Um, when you do this, you're basically going to end up updating every single dependency at the same time on your site. Now, if all of your dependencies are already up to date, not a big deal. But if you're like most folks, um, you know, your available updates page is a combination of yellow and green yellow being available updates, but not security related. Um, if you delete that composer.lock and run a composer uh, install or a composer update for that matter, you're gonna get the latest version of everything. And then testing, you know, testing can become, you know, a bit of a problem there. So usually with steps one, two, and three, I can solve 80% of the issues that, that, that I come up against. All right. Um, I might, since we're short on time, and I don't want to ignore questions and I know we have to finish a quarter after, I'm actually going to stop here, answer questions. And if I have a chance, I'll come back to this. Otherwise you have the slides and I'll be around. You can always, um, I'll show you my contact info so you can always ping me uh, wherever and ask me questions about this stuff. Um, so in the Q&A, Usman, is there a way to build Composer for multi-site setup where each site can specify their additional dependencies? Not that I know of. Um, you're kind of asking for something that would be like a require, and well, not even a required dev situation. Um, I mean, the short answer is I don't know of a way to do that. I don't know if someone else does. Maybe they can they can comment in the chat, but I do not know of a way to do that. Uh, the composer install or update. So this is a Phil's question. The composer install or update is often hanging at the update dependencies. Is there a way to save time? Phil, are using composer? So you're saying hanging. Is that indefinite hanging, or just is it just really slow? Because if it's just really slow, I would say try composer two. And I'll, I'll skip ahead to the Composer 2 uh, slides here in a moment. Um, it could also be a memory issue. Um, so those would be the two things I would look at. So very slow, Composer 1. Uh, I would try Composer 2 if possible. Um, that might solve the problem because it's so much more performant. It's faster um, and it uses a lot less memory. Um, so what, oh, I'm going to have a hard time with your name, uh, F. Stathios, F. Stathios, am I saying it right? Uh, Papadopoulos, I actually grew up with someone whose last name is Papadopoulos, so that's pretty funny. Um, anyway, uh, the dependency that F. Stathios just mentioned, uh, you don't need that for Composer 2. So Composer 1, yes, that can optimize some things. Um, Composer, if you can go to Composer 2, that would be, I think, the better solution. Uh, let me just uh, go up in this in the chat here. Is there anything that I need to? The nerd ID. We also, yeah, Thomas, um, putting the node ID in the uh, description of the patch. Great idea. Yep, yep, yep. Um, composer update, nothing. Yep, that's very similar to composer install. So yes, that's good. Usually use the URL. Okay, yep, this is all about the composer patches and the patch description. Great, 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 great. 
how to install patch with modifies modules that in front of EML, especially core version requirement. Um, so Bohaus, you basically have to create that patch and then apply to Drupal core. Um, Roger, uh, composer update dash dash locked is the same as update nothing. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about composer update lock here in a second. Um, okay, I think I'm all caught up with the chat. What is the alternative to doing, oh, here. Um, a bunch more questions. So, uh, uh, Guillaume, uh, Guillaume, I hope I'm saying your name right. I'm terrible with names. What is the best strategy when it comes to updating plugins, libraries during a project life? Do we do it regularly to maintain everything up to date, even if it involves more testing? You know, it's kind of like Drupal modules. Um, you know, it, you know, all of the, most of the stuff's on GitHub. So if you see an update to Composer patches, go to GitHub, see what changes are included in that in that update. If it's a security update, yeah, sure. But if it's like a minor update and it's like adding new functionality that you don't need and you're fine where you are, then don't update if it means more testing. Um, I think it's it, it's not all that different from you know from non-security updates to Drupal modules. Um, what to do when you get memory limit? Um, apart from increasing server resources, use Composer 2. Honestly, that's gonna solve 95% of the memory limit issues out there. What is the alternative of deleting, this is a David, what is the alternative of deleting composer.lock and do a composer install um, after? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by like an alternative. I, you know, I don't recommend de deleting composer.lock. That's like the nuclear option. That's the absolute last resort. Um, you know, if you do that and do a composer install, you're basically going to, you're basically removing your history of that project, not in a Git sense, but in, in, in the versions that are currently in use. And Composer install is gonna to try to install the latest version based on every single version constraint. So it's updating everything all at once. Um, the no install flag um, when, when creating a project. So when you do a Composer create, that does two things. That downloads the Composer template and then it runs a Composer install. When you, add, when you do a composer create dash dash no install, you just do the first part, right? You just do the download, but it doesn't actually do the composer install. So a lot of folks do the no install because they want the template and they wanna make changes to the template before they do the install. Uh, version control conflicts related to composer outlock, uh, Boyan, yes, those are like some slides that unfortunately I don't think we're gonna get to because I think I'm just about out of time. Um, I'm getting the, I'm getting the hook here in just three minutes. So I will, um, da -da, da -da -da. okay. Last question in the discussion chat for now, then I'm going to, I'm going to go skip right to composer two, since we seem to have a lot of questions about that. Um, Sergio, hopefully again, apologies if I didn't pronounce your name, right. The problem with composer two at the moment is not all contrib modules are compatible. Um, true a lot of them are. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna fly past these so we can talk about Composer 2. Um, Composer 2 is here, it's a lot faster and it uses way, way, way less memory. Um, compatible with many, uh, I hate the word popular, maybe well-used Composer plugins um, and they can be used concurrently. So, not everybody on your team has to update a Composer 2 at the same time. The lock files are compatible. And I say that's semi-official because it's not anywhere in the documentation, but one of the authors of Composer did write about this um, in somewhere on GitHub. Um, so you can try it today. I know early on someone suggested I change this slide to self-update dash dash one. Yep, and I, yeah, that's fine. I'm gonna agree with that. So here, let me, I'll make this change so that everybody has that, that dash one. Well, here, let me put the two first. And then if you wanna go back one, you just do a dash dash one. So it's very easy to, oops, sorry. It's very easy to go up to version two um, and then go back to version one if, if you're not cool with it. Um, composer plugins that are that are often used, you know, the recommended project, all the Drupal core stuff is composer patches is ready. 
Um, if you use the Composer Installer's Extender, this allows you to add like JavaScripty type dependencies using Composer. Um, I use this because I have a lot of clients who where we do commit the dependencies. Um, this automatically re re removes uh, extra .git directories. And again, it's not an official release, but there is a Composer 2 branch for this. So for me, once I have these four, um, pretty much for all my sites, I, I'm able to use Composer 2. And, um, you know, there are some, some folks in the chat are mentioning, there are still some, some cases out there, some modules um, that aren't supported by Composer 2, but I think those are, the numbers rapidly dwindling. So um, I would say try Composer 2. If it works, you're never gonna go back because it, 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 it's, it's a lot faster. There's the require statement if you want to use the Composer 2 branch of something. Um, here's my contact info. I'll leave this up. So if you have any questions, I know we skipped a whole section, so apologies for that. You can ping me on Drupal.org or on Twitter, or pretty much anywhere on Ultimike. Um, Ultimike. I think we had one more question come in. Let me see if I can hit that. Um, Self-upgrade, create compatibility issues, and we need to uh, downgrade. So self-upgrade module, I'm not sure what your, um, and Ravi Shankar, hopefully I'm saying your name right. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm, I absolutely believe that there are some cases out there that um, uh, some modules and some plugins out there that aren't yet compatible with Composer 2. And all I can say is um, make sure there's an open issue either on GitHub or on Drupal.org about it. Um, and the more people that comment on that issue and request it uh, compatibility with Composer 2, the faster it'll happen. So, all right, with that, I will take a deep breath. I went one minute over. Sorry, Ricardo, who is our, our, our moderator here. Uh, thank you everybody for the, um, uh, for the kind words. Um, the slides are available. If you wanna go back and just review those slides, if you're interested in that one section, um, again, I, I'm going to try and be around um, uh, this week. Um, otherwise, you can always ping me on Twitter or anywhere and um, let me know. Oh, very kind words. Wow, fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hopefully next year we will all be together in, uh, uh, in Europe. Well, I know my wife and I were very much, uh, very much looking forward to a, a little December trip uh, to Spain. So hopefully next year. <laughs>